you know, it's too young. They're going to damage their growth plates. That's still a thing that you hear. So if you look at the other side, right? Like, what is the potential risk of not doing it? Mm. You see that that's so much higher. Like, we right. know that there's no risk to growth plates. Mm. You know, it's interesting because we'll we'll say, well, you can't do that, but then they'll let them do other activities that have a much higher forced load on the body than resistance training or exercising would. Hello everyone, welcome to the Movement and Performance Podcast, where it is my goal to help people get active and reconnect with their body. Today I have with me Rick Howard. He's an associate professor at Westchester University. I know him best for his contributions with the NSCA and in particular with long-term athletic development. Today we'll be talking about optimizing physical health and fitness for youth. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Give us like a little summary of long-term athletic development. Like what does that mean or, or yeah, what are cool. some of the yeah, pillars? Cool. Um, long-term athletic development is interesting because most of us think of it in the modern context, basically based on what Isim Valle put together starting in the 1990s. Mm. It's kind of a way, and, and Canada had this initiative where they're going from the playground to the podium. Mm. So they thought that it would be a nice way to help get more Canadians fit Mm. Uh, of Olympic potential, but then they said, you know what, it could also help the overall health and well-being of the Canadian population. They included some things for physical education. Their model has done a great job and it's been shared in many different countries. The U.S. has its own version of the model, the American Development Model, that's used mm. by the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Mm. So it's been modified, changed, or adapted in a number of, of ways. But I think the cool part about LTAD is like, that's not where it started. Mm. Like you could trace it all the way back to Roman Agaji, like mm. training for soldiers in all different ways. Like how do we get everybody physically and mentally prepared to do mm. whatever it is they need to do? So throughout all of time, you could look at it in that context with long-term athletic development, you could call it whatever you want. And you know, part of the issue and part of the, the conversation we had doing the position statement is that really what we want to call it. Because mm. as soon as you say the word athlete or athletic, you'll lose an audience. Mm. So can you call it well-being? Can you call it health? And you know, um, one of the cool things I have in my classes, we go through all those definitions. And depending on where you look, you're gonna get a different definition. Mm. So we finally settled and said, you know what? People know what LTAD is, kinda. Or mm. if they do know, they know this phrase, so let's stick with this phrase. So that's what we stuck with, LTAD, long-term athletic development, different from long-term athlete development, right? So mm. athlete is more like really focused on that one person as an athlete. Athletic is like, we looked at it like, what's athleticism? Mm. Like how do we develop somebody to excel in whatever they wanna do, whether it's in an athletic context or not, getting back to Margaret Whitehead's definition, you know, so all right, so um, within the context or within your own given level of endowment, how athletic are you? And I think mm. that's part of our issue in society is we always look at that, that wellness continuum on the sickness end. Mm. And as long as we're not here, as long as we're kind of in the middle, we're not gonna worry about it too much. Like, mm. why not be on the wellness end? Why not be on the performance end? Right. So I think LTAD kind of helps us to see that, you know, we really could be on the better end of that spectrum than always just trying to stave off sickness all the time. Yeah. I took a happiness class uh, yeah. years ago and they, you know, prefaced the whole class by saying, you know, for years we studied depression, mm -hmm. but we never studied happiness. <laughs> like why, yeah, why? you know, yeah. Yeah. and uh, it kind of is the same thing, you know, it's like a lot of the same principles, but mm -hmm. one can bring you from sick to healthy and one can bring you from healthy to maybe better. Yeah, right. Um, but so would you say... So when you said like losing a population, it's funny. I also thought about the title of this episode and I usually, you know, sometimes it changes. I mm -hmm. put a tentative title in the beginning, but I was thinking optimizing physical health and fitness for youth. And again, cause if I use the word athlete, uh -huh. I was getting that same debate right, yeah, in my head. Yeah. Uh -huh. Will I lose some people exactly. on it? Yeah. But so would you say that this is something for all youth that, you know, anybody who wants to, you know, embark on a physically healthy lifestyle mm -hmm. or some people may know the word physical literacy in this podcast, some people might not, but right, right. just a, a life of physical health. Mm -hmm. Is it for all youth or is it just for those striving to be in athletics? Well, you know, a lot of the LTAD models have the different uh, pathways. Right. So there's the, the elite performance pathway that you mm -hmm. can go and here are the things you need to do to get there. Then there's like the recreational pathways you want to participate, but then there's like the active for life according mm. to the Canadian model and other models. So they use, well, maybe you're not gonna be an elite athlete or even a recreational athlete, but you're gonna be active. Mm. So here's a path you can go to be active. I think one of the things that we look at for LTAD is that 
people don't really like this terminology either, but it's cradle to grave. Mm. So it should be something that starts as soon as possible and goes for as long as possible. It's like retirement. Right? Mm. So, so we wouldn't retire. Well, you know, I, I did my exercises, but then I retired and I stopped. But that's the mentality people have. So LTAD gives you everything you need, the motor skills, the strength, and all of the background, the foundation that you need to continue to be a happy mover for your whole entire life. So why would you ever stop that? So uh, that's my favorite part about LTAD. We refer to it sometimes as LTAD, shorter to say. Hmm. So when you're looking at LTAD, you're saying, oh, this is something that's gonna keep me going for my whole life. And that's where it really becomes a framework right. for physical literacy. So do you um, think it, why would it be important to start when you're young, right? Because some people might say, ah, I can worry about that when I'm older, mm -hmm. when it matters more. Like uh, I could get away with not working out now and maybe I'll, Although I might argue differently, but um, why start young? Why, why, why take that initiative now or get your kids involved as young as possible? Well, I like the, the analogy of brushing your teeth. You, know, right. you don't wait till you're 12 to brush your teeth. You don't wait till you're 20 to brush your teeth. You start young. Right. Right? You develop good habits, first of all. Um, it, it's a lot easier to keep your teeth clean than to clean them later. Right. So like, why not start being active now? Why not enjoy it? Why not embrace it? Right. Um, we know that the human body is meant to move. Mm. So why not allow that move? And I think we get stuck in a couple places. The first one is we think it has to be regimented and controlled. Mm. It doesn't. It should be fun. Mm. Like for kids just getting to move, giving them opportunities and exposures to go out and play, mm. to experience in different play settings, different sports settings, different activity settings, see what they like, what they don't like. And then you can actually use what they call the coach's eye. Like how do you actually see the kid move? Mm. What can I change? How can I help? What can I do? And then just get them on that pathway. Mm. It's just something that you're always going to enjoy. It becomes part of your structure and your schedule. And then if kids like see their parents or the, the adults that they look up to doing the same thing, they're more likely to buy into it. And then when their peer group becomes those who have influence, if everybody's been exercising already, well, now their peer group's going to be a peer group of influence to continue to exercise. We kind of yeah. lose that and we only look at the sports segment of it. You know, the same people that say, well, we shouldn't exercise until later are the ones that say we have to get our son or daughter into sports by the time they're five mm. or they're never going to get that college scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I make this like announcement. Uh, I try to give a good pep talk to some. I, I work with uh, aspiring phys ed teachers mm -hmm. sometimes and I tell them that, you know, I mentioned the book Outlive already, and I'm going to reference it again, <laughs> but he says the four horsemen, there's fast death and slow death. Mm -hmm. And as we age, like if you're not, you know, maybe uh, some traumatic car accident or something like that, if, you're, if you didn't, you know, if you passed all that stuff, it's probably either cancer, mm -hmm. heart disease, uh, metabolic disease, or dementia that's going to take you out. Sure. And probably the number one treatment for those four things is movement. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of research to support that people that don't, if they're not active in their youth, they're less likely to be active in older adulthood. Yep. So like when you're talking about building this foundation, you mentioned the piece about um, retirement. And I think about it as a starting a retirement plan early and you're mm -hmm. investing into it, that you're um, building those habits in the youth and building this positive association so that as they get older, they can, it's easier to do, and it's probably the most important thing to do as you yeah, age, yeah. arguably. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so diving into some specific pieces, so like, do you think it's, imp so we know it's important for all kids to move, right? And it's yep. good to build those habits young, but um, is it important for them to, should they specialize? Should they get a lot of variety, um, you know, if a kid wants to be, you know, should they pick one sport and really get good at it or, or get a lot of experience? Well, it's a great question because usually kids don't pick that one sport. Mm. It gets chosen for them. Mm. You know, you don't have your six-year-old going, you know, I, I saw on the internet today that the baseball <laughs> camp point. starts next week. Can you sign me up for that? That's what I want to do, right? They get signed up for it and then it becomes the parent's social circle. Mm. Like they get to know the other parents are kind of hanging around at the practices. So it becomes that culture. Mm. And so they, it's easy for them to stay with that. Whereas if you get them to try different things, it it's, might be a little more demanding. I was at a coaches conference yesterday, actually, we were talking about this because there are, are very few organizations that you can go to the one spot to mm. play all these different sports. Mm. Usually you have to go, here I go for soccer, here I go for baseball, here I go for tennis, there I go for lacrosse. So you're running all over. And if you have more than one child, it's, it's really difficult 
right. to schedule. So it becomes a lot easier to say, look, if you're going to play soccer, you're just going to keep playing soccer. It doesn't cost a lot. Easy right. to get you there. Um, doesn't really require a lot of skill initially to run the kick the ball and everybody's happy. But the thought process is, what does the kid actually like? Mm. Right. So if you like running and kicking the soccer ball, keep playing that. And we talk about this too, because you can integrate other movement patterns into that practice. Mm. We don't, but you could. Mm. Right. So like a lot of times soccer coaches and in, in the U.S. especially, they're volunteers usually. So they do what they did when they mm. came up. This is, these are the drills we ran. These are the skills that we were trying to help them to understand and learn. Rather than saying, let's, let's look at their overall physical literacy. Let's help them really develop as a young athlete. And then we'll use soccer as a vehicle to make that happen. Mm. So it's a different mentality in our practices. And I always thought, and, and I, I walk my dogs at this park all the time where there's always practices going on, right. usually baseball, softball, or soccer. Mm. So, and I watch, and the parents are all sitting in their nice, comfortable chairs. They're usually on their phone. <laughs> or maybe they're talking to another parent waiting for the end. I'm like, why aren't they out there? Right. Like, why isn't there some say, you know what? If, if you worked with your son a little bit more, like, just play around the house, but just get him to move from side to side, right? Right. Because he does really good straight ahead, but he, he needs a little work side. Like, do something at home to help with that. And then we'll We'll see on Tuesday when you come back to practice. Right. But we don't really engage everybody in that process. A lot right. of the reason I think is because what we we're talking about, those parents, <laughs> they never did all that, right? So right. the last thing they want is say, hey, come on out here and show your son how to move right. from side to side. They'd be mortified. Right. So if we could get the generation coming up now to be confident movers, then they could help that next generation because now it's inherent. Now, now mm. you want to you want everybody to see that here's the way to go. But we're not there yet. So specializing is easier. Right. So it's easier should we try to move away from that you think like is it better to give them more variety you think well, all the data suggests that it's much better to give them the variety yeah the data suggests that most of those who are successful later on played a variety of sports because there's mm. something called field sense mm. right so if you're playing lacrosse you get a better field sense for a basketball court there's some similar strategies and techniques that are there um, what you see out on soccer pitch you might also see on a lacrosse field so you might be able to see different things by experiencing in a different way rather mm. than just focusing on just here's what I see when I go to lacrosse practice here are the drills that I'm running because of the game because the game isn't going to match what you did in practice right. so it's how do you solve movement problems in different ways so if you get to see it in different ways playing different sports you're much better at doing it right the ball speed might be different the size of the ball is different um, how you carry the ball might be different so you're learning all these different ways of doing those movements which from a phys ed perspective is exactly what we're doing, but we're not. Mm. So to really help kids learn how to move in a variety of ways, um, phys ed usually see stations. Like let's right. go from this station to that station, and they're not even put together in any way except usually that it matches the music. Right. I got a three minute song, so you're gonna move and you're gonna do this one for a minute, then I'll move you so at the end of three minutes, you've done three exercises and then we'll change. Right. But that's not, like if you look at strength and conditioning, that's not how it's supposed to be set up. Like it doesn't follow the particular exercise order to help you grow and develop at our best. So I think that one of the cool things about LTAD is it started to introduce some strength and conditioning concepts mm. into phys ed, into sports practice that aren't there. So when we go back and talk about your sports specialization, they're not getting the physical development they need to support that. Mm. So we used to always say, well, you can't, you can't play to get in shape. You should get in shape to play. Mm. So how do you help kids play, move around, and get all the physical fitness attributes that they need to be successful no matter which sport they choose? Mm. So we don't look at it that way. Say, all right, so you're going to play soccer. And you know, so they figure out, well, you know, a soccer player will usually run maybe six miles in a game. So go out and run a lot of distance. Mm. But that's not the kind of running that you do in soccer. Right. So we don't match energy systems and training the way that we should. And there's now when you look at all those opportunities, your creativity is almost endless with what you could do in practice right. to help kids to get better at soccer, lacrosse, basketball, whatever it is, by having all these different movements, straight ahead movements, multilateral movements, different types of development, different ways of developing strength and endurance. And you, I never see that in practice. Mm. It's always the cones. Mm. And then it's always a small net. Yep. Now yeah. you see some short-sighted games, which you didn't see before, right. so it's a little bit better, but we're really not developing those physical attributes mm. of those players using that sport as a vehicle to do that. Yeah, um, I call it disguising repetition. Mm -hmm. yeah. And have, I, I, I have a creative mind, so it's a little easier for me, and I enjoy that process. Mm -hmm. Others, uh, it might be a little harder to do that. But I love creating a new drill or activity yeah. uh, to be able to target something I want to go after, sure. a motor yep. skill or yep. fitness concept. Right. Um, but yeah, so it sounds like um, variety is important. Mm -hmm. And 
you mentioned two pieces that I want to differentiate. So like the motor skill development and then the fitness side. Right. So when we say variety, are we talking about both? Are both important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And one of yeah. the things that I think motor skills got lost somewhere. Yeah. Oh, like you, all of a sudden we got like in the 80s and we had go, the right. Ken Cooper developed the aerobics and everything thought we had to go do aerobics. And then we looked at the five elements of health related fitness. Right. So phys ed, like they ate it, right? They right. said, that's what we're doing. Health related fitness. Everything's health related fitness. How are we going to measure that? We're going to do a fitness gram. Right. Well, the guy who uh, did one of the other tests that we used to use all the time for testing gross motor development hmm. went to Westchester. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he talked about like how it came to be that fitness gram just like overran everything like with this whole fitness craze. Wow. It's all about fitness. But if you think about what fitness is by definition. <laughs> right. You fit for what? Fit for what? Yeah. So fitness isn't <laughs> something where you explore and you enjoy and you play. That's physical activity and sports. Right. Fitness has a specific outcome mm. through exercise. Mm. Exercise is something right. that it's regimented, it's structured, it's controlled to help you reach whatever your fitness outcome might be. Mm. But that's not necessarily what people always want. And they wonder like why over 80% of the population isn't active. Well, because you didn't bring it to them where they like it. Right. Like, do you want to go exercise? Do you want to go to the gym and do this, 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 and this? Like, some of us, I love that. I've been doing right. that since I was a kid. I love it, but I know not everybody does. So how do you get people excited about that? And a friend of mine always says, you know, why is it that sports get all the cool toys and phys ed doesn't? Right. Where's battle ropes and physical education? Right. I mean, it, it's sports skills, it's motor skills, and it's fitness. Right. <laughs> like, why right. do you always have to do push-ups? Like, why do we have to have gyms with treadmills? Mm. And usually I'll, I'll do conversations with physical educators and different people around the country. And I'll say, right, how many of you love to run on a treadmill? <laughs> it's usually Probably never, it's, <laughs> it's never more than three or 4%. Right. I'm like, why would you do that to kids? Right. Why would you put a treadmill in a gym for kids to run up? You don't like it. You right. know they're not going to like it. Right. But if you think it looks good. You think it's giving them that lifetime fitness. Lifetime mm. fitness is an adult construct. Right. It's something that we created to mm. say that this is what we want you to do when you become an adult rather than giving kids all these tools, which is what LTAD and physical literacy do, they mm. give you all the tools you decide. Mm. I absolutely love it. So you could, you could do whatever you want. But you know, I've had conversations with people like up in arms, like, well, you couldn't play competitive sport in your 20s and 30s and 40s. I'm like, why not? Mm. If you have the skills to do it, why can you? Right. Why is it that so many of our kids get so burned out by the time they're 12 or 13 that they're dropping out? The others are dropping out after high school because they're so injured. <laughs> Right. I was going to mention that piece, too. Yeah, they get injured playing. And then they, like, a lot, I do personal training still, too. I like doing that just to keep my hands in it. And I'll get clients that they can hardly move. Mm. They have these old sports injuries that are just still nagging them. Right. So how are you going to get them to be physically active? So I go back to the part where, like, we're not getting them in shape to play a sport. They're just playing a sport, mm. hoping to get in shape. But then they're repeating all of these same movement patterns. Mm. And then if something comes up that doesn't follow that pattern, they don't know how to adjust because they haven't learned how to create different movement strategies to solve those problems in a new scenario. Wow. Yeah, I had about a million thoughts as you were going <laughs> through there. And that's something I preach all the time is I feel like we're missing the motor skill piece a mm -hmm. bit or, you know, learning technique. I just did some posts on that recently. It's like, you know, you, um, I see a lot of kickboxing classes because I do the martial arts mm -hmm. and people want to get the aerobic side from that kickboxing class but you still have to learn how to punch you can't go into that class and not learn how to punch and you're repeating this again and again and again and not expect to get an injury uh, oh my shoulder hurts my this my that well <laughs> right. if you're going to just jab cross uppercut and mm -hmm. hook then know how to do those four things really well right exactly. you know yep. learn yep. the technique for it and if they're not teaching it in the class then you know you can learn it before after hopefully the coach takes a couple minutes to teach you that mm -hmm. but the motor skill piece and and then the other big one is the enjoyment is right. you mentioned and, and it stands out to me like you know i don't enjoy running on a treadmill but i could play ultimate frisbee for days mm -hmm. And I'll probably gain more from that experience than anything. Okay. And how are we connecting people to things that they actually enjoy, whether it's kids, adults, or anybody? Exactly. Um, we need to do a much better job of that. You know, yeah. The motor skill thing is really interesting. I was at the uh, Shape America convention. Oh, cool. Was so really, was I. I'm surprised. Oh, yeah, sorry we didn't there see each other. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if you saw in the back, there's a booth where they have like a moving, it was like a wall and there were targets yeah. and you had to throw and hit the target. Yeah. It was fascinating to me to watch physical educators. The more difficult the target got, the more they resorted to poor motor skills. Wow. Because we know the throwing and catching are two of the motor skills that really help to predict lifetime fitness activities. Mm. Their throwing ability, like 
they were throwing with their dominant foot forward. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, how did that happen? And, and like, instead of throwing it, they're like just trying to shove it and push it to just like just to hit the target. Yeah. So the whole purpose of the activity was lost on the physical educators who are trying this particular station. Um, it was in the exhibit hall, kind of where the coffee talk tables were. Yeah. I was mesmerized. I sat there for an hour just watching different physical educators going, like some get it, of course, but I saw more than I should have seen who right. resorted to really poor motor skills once it became a little bit more challenging. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a bit, it's a lost thing that, especially now more than ever, because I think we're moving into a time and we're actually already there where people don't really have to move to survive. Mm -hmm. So if enjoyment isn't there, right. right? In the past, you're moving because you had to move or you had to work just involved that. You had to cut a log, you had to whatever. My grandfather, uh, later in life, he lived in Brooklyn his whole life, but mm -hmm. moved upstate and mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, had a farm and, and um, you know, for heat in the house, he would chop his own wood. Like sure. you think about survival and you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're gonna freeze that night. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great motivation, but mm -hmm. we just don't have that motivation anymore. It's nope. not really there. You know, heat's provided, food's, pr food's provided. You can just order it. You could even have someone pick up your laundry. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, so if moving into the future, I think enjoyment is even 20 times more important right. oh, yeah. than ever before. Yeah. Um, but so I wanted to touch on a, a big hot question that always comes my way uh, from parents. When it comes to the fitness side of things and when it comes to strength training or weightlifting, mm -hmm. at what age can kids um, or children, youth, adolescents, I know those different terms, we can maybe describe what those different terms are, yep. but at what age can kids start to lift? Well, the general rule of thumb is when they want to. Okay, I like that one. And also when they can listen to and follow directions. Mm. And I'm like, all right, so you talk to physical educators, you're like, right, that knocks out my middle school kids and half the high school kids, right? <laughs> so they're, they're not doing that. So, but yeah, if they, when they have that capacity, but they should want to be there because otherwise it's a danger to them. Right. You know, if, if parents are, you know, and, and they, they have the best intentions. And I think parents get a bad rap a lot of times. They want what's best for their kids. <clears throat> but a lot of times they read something that's not, really the best for the kids and then right. they run with that because they think that that's what they need to be doing right so like weight like resistance training and we like to use the term resistance training because it doesn't have to be weights mm. it'll be partner stuff body weight band tubes like kids should be introduced to all different types of modes and mm. modalities of training from an early age see what you like see what you can do um you know you'll have kids that are a little bit heavier like we always say well everybody should be doing push-ups Mm. No, no, they should not. Right. You know, if you're heavy, you're not going to do well at push-ups. Just, right. just like running, right? You're not going to want to run. Right. That doesn't work. But what can work? Mm. So maybe you throw a med ball. Maybe you're really good at that. Or maybe you like to use weights or bands or tubes or something. Or it's like you talked about, you know, ultimate. What's the activity that you could get some cardio out of but you really enjoy? Mm. So we would set up like different med ball circuits, talk about battle ropes, like all these different things. Like you don't realize you're getting in shape, but you mm. are. And you're having fun at the same time. And we miss that. So the, the key thing is to, for children, and um, NSCA has a position statement on resistance training for youth. Uh, we also did one for the British Journal of Sports Medicine where we got like 20 different organizations to sign on and adopting it. Mm. Shape America was one of those. So what we're talking about is children basically are from around ages five or six up until puberty, mm. which varies and changes. On average, around 12-ish for girls, 13, 14 for boys, uh, and then you hit adolescence after that growth spurt. So the growth spurt is a really critical time in youth development of how to affect your training for kids as their bodies change. Mm. They get a little taller, their limbs get a little longer, their arms get longer, uh, their torrent gets longer. So they have a whole different center of mass. Mm. Their ability to do those motor skills goes out the window sometimes you're like what happened to you right? You can't. <laughs> right so we have to go back and make sure we're continuing to share those motor skills through the growth and development phases and during the spurts and then be aware like if all of a sudden your center of gravity is higher because your legs got longer you gotta figure I, that out you gotta figure that out do i want you doing all these cutting drills and different things mm. well sometimes that happens because we haven't taken that into consideration and the u.s is way behind other countries right. in terms of monitoring growth and development of our kids mm. like when are you hitting that peak height velocity to know that this 
is a time that I need to be a little bit more sensitive in the type of training that I'm offering you because I want to keep you on the right path. Mm. And then when you're in childhood, am I giving you all these different opportunities of what to do and how to do it and to make it fun and exciting and challenging? And you get to create some of your own stuff. I've had kids create some of the best exercises and challenges. Like they are just so true. creative. It's unbelievable. It's true. Um, and then like once you get older and you start to figure out, well, this is what I want to do. I really want to play this sport. And then you start to I could focus the training more for that sport. Mm. But, you know, we use the term like sport agnostic a lot, right? So you have to figure out like what are those general physical conditioning principles that are applicable to all sports. Mm. Like if you start just thinking about just doing a sports specific training program, you're missing all the other fitness attributes. Right. Is that really helping that kid as they right. grow older? Say, hey, you know what, that, that's a power sport, so we're not gonna have you do cardio at all anymore. Right. Really? <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah. like why aren't we including all of the different fitness parameters but recognizing when we should be working with youth. Youth is that broad, all-encompassing. So children and adolescents all fit under the umbrella of youth. Right. Right. So for youth, how do we keep them training, liking what they're doing, enjoying it, growing from that, and then developing those healthy habits and all the different fitness attributes. Right. Like why does changing direction suddenly go out the window when you hit high school? Mm -hmm. For most kids. I know, I, that, that's a huge one. Right, like nobody sprints anymore. Like, if you're not go out running long, <laughs> slow distance, like you never- I might be the only guy. Everyone yeah, looks at me like I'm weird. Me too still, right? So like, <laughs> I look even weirder, right? So like I'll go out, because I don't like running long. I, I like running distance 60 pounds ago, right? But I don't like it anymore. So I can sprint, I can go back and We're forth. We're very similar. Right, keep my cardio going. But like, we don't think about that. We're like, oh, everybody should go out and run long, slow distance. No, no, they, we're not all built the same. Right. So we don't take any of that stuff into consideration, unfortunately, and that's what LTAD helps us to think about right. how do we look at your biomechanics how do we look at your overall genetics like how do we put stuff together to match where you are so mm. that you're going to enjoy it and want to keep doing it yeah another piece i mentioned you know i come to like certain enlightenment in some episodes but i call it now like um you could use different words but like fitness dating mm. so like you're you're seeing what activity you're kind of playing with them all mm -hmm. and you're like oh experimenting and oh i gravitate more over here or, yeah, yeah. oh i do like the long distance running awesome good for mm -hmm. you oh no i do like more of the sprinting yeah, i do yeah. and there's this like almost like a dating right. thing right. and yeah. it's the you know very very similar in life you know in teens people first start looking around a bit yeah. more but um yeah and finding this match then you keep bringing up that point and i think that's important yeah and then another big thing that you uh, kind of just made me think of also is a reminder of the difference between athletics and general health. Mm -hmm. Like when you are specific at something, because you said like power, and it made me think of powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And then you specialize in that one thing, but then you neglect all this other stuff. Right. And the more you invest in this one component, <clears throat> the further you drift sometimes from you know, you could be the best in the world in something, but you're also like hovering a line of injury or something sure. else. Yeah, yeah. So how do we get this more holistic and well-rounded, um, you know, in athlete or individual and develop all these components? Um, but I wanted to just stay on the weightlifting piece for a minute because mm -hmm. some people ask me these questions and I want to hear it from you too. All right. So that makes sense so you can you know embark when you're ready mm -hmm. um but let's say a kid is ready like my nephew he used to watch me and his father lift right and he was like i can't wait to do what they're doing like right. he was ready pretty early mm -hmm. yep. so is there a time when it's too young to maybe start that and in particular so there is a difference between i guess they're similar, but resistance training and weightlifting, right? We're, we're all doing some form of resistance training. If you're mm -hmm. on the monkey bar, that's right. resistance training. Right. Yeah. But when it's more like structured weightlifting, mm -hmm. uh, that you're in the gym and you're with a barbell or you're with a dumbbell and you're deadlifting and doing that stuff, is there a time that it's too young to do that? No. Right. I mean, you probably wouldn't want somebody who's four because the bar is going to be too heavy. But, you know, <laughs> right. like once you reach that age where, yes, I want to be able to do that. And, and like we always start people say start with a dowel right right so if you teach the technique because really what you want to do is in, embrace the technique part of it not right. the amount of load right and then the variety like how many different things can you do right like can you curl a dowel can mm. you curl a dumbbell what's the difference between a dumbbell and a kettlebell like how do you mm. what differences do you feel so you could actually use it as a great teaching tool if you're looking at resistance arms right <laughs> but yeah you could do different things with it uh, like in a 
physical education setting or in the, but you're working with kids to figure it out. But the, the key is like, what is the technique? Mm. Um, there are different um, pieces out there of technique checklists, like a mm. number of one to 10. And so you could say, all right, so let's, let's look at your squat pattern, for example, because mm. there's some people that swear there's one and only one way to squat. <laughs> there's not. But you could look at somebody who's six, like what does their squat pattern look like? You've probably seen like those memes, like this kid is a year and a half has this perfect squat. Well, right. yeah, because hasn't really developed any muscle mass yet. <laughs> right. All the weight is on their head, so it's easy to sink down. When you're 10, it's different. Now your body is shifting. So you right. have to make a shift in your squat pattern based on how your body is growing. Yeah. We don't do that. But when you look at that squat pattern for their body style, what does it look like when they descend, when they ascend? How much control do they have? Because you don't want to load it if they can't control it. Mm. So you really want to look at it and say, all right, can they keep their knees in the proper alignment? Can they squat down to a proper depth? Can they keep their shoulders and shins at the same position on the way down and on the way back up? So you can look for see these key factors. I think the issue is that most people don't know what those are. Yeah. And they say, all right, well, I don't know. It looks all right to me. Let's put some weight on, see how that feels, right? right. And I've watched in the gym, like weighted lunges is probably one of my least favorite exercises because I see it done so incorrectly in the gym all the time. Right. So people don't have that proper lunge pattern of actually stepping forward, but then they put 20 pound dumbbells in their hands. It's right. even worse. And now they're shifting from one side to the other, right. trying to handle a weight that they don't have the core stability to maintain. Right. So just really focus on what those are and create a checklist, figure out what that should look like and how do you do that. And you don't have to be perfect. Right. That's the other thing. I said, well, unless you can do it perfectly, you can't load it. Right. right. Some of us, like I do much better loaded than unloaded because I'm used to being loaded. Right. Like if you have me do an unloaded squat, it doesn't look nearly as nice as it does mm -hmm. if I have a bar on my back. Mm -hmm. So you look at that with different people, like what's the pattern work? How does it work for you? Mm. Squat's a great example because do I feel better loaded anteriorly or posteriorly? Right. Up high, down low. I prefer searchers because I do strongman. So I, I prefer right. having it here, right? So it depends on where you want to have the bar, what works for you and finding out that pattern. But when yeah. you're younger, like just look at all different ways of doing stuff. Yeah, I love the idea of technique there as well because people forget that even strength training has technique yeah. and you have to learn that technique. You, mm -hmm. There's nothing that you can do that you just go in and it's only fitness right. and you can just push it. Everything, you're using something to develop that fitness and that something is a motor skill and that motor skill has to be exactly. developed. Yep. So let's say that, uh, again, I'm thinking, I'm using my nephew as an example. Mm -hmm. um, because he is dying to work out with me. And, you know, my sister, who, you know, she has some mm -hmm. comments about it. Right. But this is not specifically for him. But these are the same conversations I hear with a lot of parents. Sure. Same thing. You know, oh, well, you know, it's too young. They're going to damage their growth plates. That's still a thing that you hear. Is that true? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, there's so many myths that just don't go away. And, and I, I'll encourage everybody to follow Avery Fagenbaum, right. who is one of the authors of the paper. He's like the leading pediatric exercise science researcher internationally. Right. So on Instagram, he'll like post all of these different infographics about that. Like you know, he, one of them, he has like all these myths that just won't go away. <laughs> so that's one of them, right? And yeah. then uh, here's what to do instead. So if you look at the other side, Right. Like, what is the potential risk of not doing it? Mm. You see that that's so much higher. Like, we right. know that there's no risk to growth plates. Mm. You know, it's interesting because we'll, we'll say, well, you can't do that. But then they'll let them do other activities that have a much higher forced load on the body than resistance training or exercising would. Right. We'll say, well, that's okay. You could do that. But we don't think about that. Right. What could be like jumping? Like jumping. Right. Like, yeah. uh, jumping off of uh, an object. Yeah. You know, you look at these videos of kids on a swing, like we don't say, hey, don't don't fall out that swing. Make sure you let it slow all the way down before you get <laughs> off. Like we don't think anything about like what the load is when they fly <clears> off <throat> into space and land on the ground. Right. Like all the cool stuff we used to do, but that used to help build that strength. Mm. Now that we don't do that, we have to bring a lot of that stuff back mm. so that kids get to move in different ways and so that the load isn't so great. Right. They're still not gonna affect growth plates, but right. we just wanna make sure that the load is safe and then on the other side, it's no good being weak when you're old, right? Right. So, you know, you talk about like even simple things like grocery shopping. Mm. And I see it all the time, like people like, like they're having a hard time pushing the cart. Right. With two or three items in it. Like, wow. Right. Right. Like that stuff should still be pretty easy for most folks in their 40s and 50s, I would think. But right. It's not because they never developed that strength. And so if you're, if you're only here, then your strength starts to go down. You're not at that level where you need to be. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting an increased risk of uh, early passing by not maintaining your strength and your overall um, fitness as you get older. Yeah, there's a lot, I think, tied to grip strength is a popular mm -hmm. one nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and mortality rates. But yeah, so 
just going to hit on it a little bit further. So back to the nephew example, mm -hmm. his technique looks good. Yep. Um, he's exercising. Should he, is it okay for him to then now start to put some weight on the bar and, and put some intensity there? Is there a point where, you know, for example, one rep max, two rep max, three rep max, anything five RM and below mm -hmm. that we should avoid maybe, or is there, uh, or is it anything goes from there? So all good questions. I'll start with the first one. Does he want to do more weight? Like, is he saying, man, I just want to put more weight in the butt? Not all right. kids do. Yeah. But some kids are like, oh, this is fine. I'm good just moving this weight. Fine. Good question. Right? Yeah. Fine. So you don't have to do it today, right? So mm -hmm. what do you always say? It's a slow roast, not a microwave. So you don't have to have it <laughs> now. You don't have to peak by Friday. So do it at your own pace, what works best for you. But if he wants to, there's no problem loading it. The 1RM is an interesting thing because even most university settings, they no longer do 1RM testing. 1RM mm. is great if you're a power lifter or an Olympic weightlifter. You need to know exactly how much weight you can lift because that's the basis of your performance in, sport. in your sport. But for everybody else, it's just an indicator to let you know what load to choose. Mm. But like, so if you're working with somebody and you, you're following them, you know kind of what load they can use. Do you actually have to maximum test that? Not really. Do kids want to know how much they can? Yes. So right. in that context, it'd be much better to find out how much they could lift on a certain exercise as part of their training one day. Like you don't have to say, all right, today's testing day. We're going to test you on all these different exercises. Right. So you know what? Today, you really seem to be enjoying squatting today, for example. Right. Put a little bit more on, see how they do, see what their technique looks like. Do they have a breakdown? Mm. Like, gosh, I noticed like as soon as you get down, like once you get to your third rep, you don't, you can't focus anymore. Like your trunk leans over, something else happens, your knees cave in or whatever it is. So let's, let's focus on getting past the third or fourth rep before we see how much weight you can add. Mm -hmm. We always look at how much weight we can add rather than like, what's the quality of this rep, that rep, the next rep, and then seeing how does that motor pattern continue once we start to load it even more. Mm -hmm. So once you get there, you can do five reps, four reps, three reps. Yeah. There's nothing wrong specifically with it because there's a the concept of training age. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could have somebody who's nine, who's been working with your, your nephew's been working with you for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Training age is 1.5. Mm -hmm. You have a 14 year old come into the gym. They've never worked out before. And yet we think we could load that person. Right. Because they're 14. Right. But their training right. age is zero. Right. They should not be loaded yet. They have to start off the same way. Get the fundamentals down. Look at the motor patterns. Then load it. Yeah. But we don't look, we look at chronological age rather than our maturity age and our training age and even our psychological age. Right. It's like, how does the kid handling that load? Do they like it? Are they really not that happy about being there, getting back to the position statement? And if they're not that happy, you don't have to load it yet. Yeah. <laughs> find some find, find some other challenge. Yeah. Um, I, you know, used to read a lot of Mike Boyle back in the mm -hmm. day, and yeah. one of the things he said was technical fatigue. Mm -hmm. yeah. When your technique breaks down, you're right. done. Yeah. But it sounds like a, there's a lot tied to, and actually... I just thought of another one, but my old coach used to say technique first, speed and power second. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of what you're saying is tied to technique and psychology. Like, right. or do they want to be there? Are yep. they excited to embark on that next piece? Mm -hmm. And does the technique look good? If that's all clear, it sounds like intensity is not an issue. Right. Uh, you, can, you can load things. The problem is not loading. The problem is more so pushing someone when they don't want to, mm -hmm. and um, maybe having poor technique and poor loading technique. on poor technique. Yeah, loading on poor technique. Absolutely right. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that helps uh, put a stamp on that. <laughs> there for you go. Many so, parents. Right, yeah. Well, absolutely. Because you know, parents don't know. They're not in the field. And even a lot of people who are in the field, like they don't think about it. Yeah. Because when you look at the textbooks and you go out and you do training, like what do you, what's the first thing you increase? Let's put more weight on. Like it's yeah. just a natural thing to do. Yeah. Now let's see, well, already you did four. Can you do five? Right. Yeah, we, I used to work in high school too. Ego gets the best of us oh, yeah. all, yeah. you know, yeah. especially yeah. young mm -hmm. males. Right. And I can't tell you how many times I saw poor form and, and loading the bar. Right. Yeah. So I couldn't agree with you more about the technique piece. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, like my nephew, you talk about that training age. He does work with me. He does have right. a better training age. Sure. He can start to add some intensity in some places. Absolutely, right. yeah. Um, not every exercise every day right? yeah. so we all know that but like all right they just having a really good day with this exercise Let, let's see what this looks like right so you make it part of the routine and then they're not going to want to go out when you're not around and say let's see how much i could really lift right right so if you can control that then it's much better off because you're focusing on the technique and the strategies of the days right yeah. are there any 
health benefits that you think kids can get from these things? So like, should they be strength training, developing their fitness? And so it's not just the idea of um, you know, if you do it, you might get hurt. Mm -hmm. It's more like if you don't do it, right, right. you might get you hurt. Might, exactly. <laughs> well, that that's true? what the literature, especially in sports participation, right? That you know, strength has a great effect on reducing the risk of injury. Mm. Like we never say we're preventing injury, but we can re greatly reduce the risk of injury just because you're strong enough to be able to handle the loads. Mm. So you talked about like those forces that come, who knows where and when, you're solving those mo movement problems down the field, the quarter, wherever something happens, are you strong enough to be able to withstand that? Mm. Are you strong enough to be able to get from the first quarter to the fourth quarter? Mm. It's not just about, can I run far enough to get there? If I don't have the strength to do it, I'm still gonna have a breakdown in technique. We know it has lots of positive effects on our overall health. We used to think, well, we shouldn't grip anything. You're talking about grip strength earlier. We shouldn't grip it because it's going to make, make our blood pressure go up. Mm. No, it actually helps your blood pressure over time by improving blood flow. So the grip strength itself, very helpful with longevity and helping mm. us to get to that next stage. Um, so all these things become very important for us. Osteoporosis risk, so making sure we have good bone strength all the way through our lives, especially important for female athletes. So you look at all of these different things. Resistance training um, basically is like the ultimate fitness tool. Mm. The other part of that, we talked about how important the motor skills are. The motor skills and the muscle strength are so very closely linked with mm. each other. Mm. So when you're talking about a lunge pattern, when somebody does it, is it that they don't have the motor pattern or they don't have the strength for the movement? So if you're focusing on getting them stronger, then that helps the motor pattern look better. And so then you can actually help to increase motor skills by improving strength as well. And you look at that across different sports. Um, tennis is usually brought up like for serving velocity and different things. The stronger you can get, the more likely you are to be able to do throwing, catching, and different motor skill abilities because you have the strength to do those movements. Mm, I love it. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit back to parents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, parents are oftentimes helping youth in this journey. Right. Is there any advice you know, we kind of went through a lot already, but yep. is there any advice specifically for parents as they're helping their kids on this journey? Listen. Yeah. You know, listen, to the kids are going to tell you. Kids are so much smarter in that context than, than I know I was growing up. Like somebody told me to do something like, okay. But like, you know, <laughs> now kids are like, why? I don't feel that this is right. and I'm not buying into this. You know, so you'll have to explain it and understand it. So have some of the information to be able to explain it, but also be supportive. Because, you know, they always say the worst part about youth sports is the car ride home, mm. right? So, you know, you're always supposed to say, I love to watch you play. Like, those are the five words we always say, right? But then you're supposed to like, like, what does that mean? Mm. Like, how are you really showing your kid that you're there supporting them in their journey? Not saying, hey, you know what? If you're going to if you're gonna make a D1 school by the time you're 14 to get that scholarship, you better do it now. Um, I just saw an interesting uh, note from Lee Taft, if you follow him. Yeah, too, I talking, had him on the podcast. Oh, did he? Oh, cool. Yeah. But he was <laughs> talking about like how the NCAA now, like everybody said, we got to get that college scholarship. They're saying like the transfer portal and NIL is changing all that. Right. So it's not necessarily that you have to be getting involved now to get that. There's so many other opportunities now where scouts and recruits are looking at athletes. They don't necessarily have to go look at travel ball or all these other things. The parents think that that's the way that their kid is going to get noticed. Mm. So as all of the technology and the methodologies change, it still gets back to make sure you're working on those fundamentals mm. and then making sure they're a good kid. Right. <laughs> and making sure you're a good parent because there are a lot of recruits who will say, you know what, I met with the parents and they're like, there's no way I want that on my campus. Wow. Right. That's not the type of personality match for our program. Mm. Right. So that it's all well, fine and good to embrace the process and really love everything that's going on. I think parents often get a bad rap, mm. but some parents make that happen. So don't, don't be that parent. Yeah. Uh, you just made me think of a question I meant to ex ask earlier, but um, for students that do have a potential for a scholarship mm -hmm. and we know that variety is better but now in that instance you're now competing with this specialization thing like right. I kind of have to specialize in my mm -hmm. area should that student still dabble in this variety along the way should they have off season mm -hmm. should they what can they do to maintain their health while still specializing yeah and that's a really good question too because a lot of times well they just can only do this did you ever right. read the athlete athletic skills model Oh, it's been a while. Yeah, it's over there. So yeah, it's but a it's while. a really good book, and it talks about like all these different like complementary sports that, that help that, and then other sports that these are the skills you're not getting. Mm. So you're going to focus like eighty percent of your time on your specific sport. Mm. 
Hmm. But there still has to be some general physical preparation, not necessarily for that sport, but just in general, right. just to keep well-rounded because you don't know what's going to happen in your sport. So using some of those models and guidelines of complementary sports and sports that you're not getting those fitness attributes from to really help you be well-rounded, it's going to help you in the long run. Yeah, yeah. you're still going to focus on your sport, but you know, if you go to high school and you're going to be a math major, you don't stop taking English classes. Right. So I think a lot of times if you go back and use analogies in the classroom, it makes you scratch your head about sports, right? right. Like you don't get yelled at in math class if you don't do well on a question in class. Right. You don't, they don't make you run outside because you missed a problem in English or you, you couldn't spell a word or something, right? But right. we think that's perfectly fine in sports. Same thing with that specialized, you're only going to play this sport and only that. But you don't do that and say, you know what? I've decided that I'm going to go to Princeton. I'm going to major in computer science. Oh, all right, that's it for the rest of your classes. Right. Right. You still take gen eds. <laughs> right. Right. So there's still that need to do all these things. But for some reason, we look at sports different from everything else in society. And I don't right. Know that's interesting yeah it's critical thinking almost right mm -hmm. or yep. but critical moving right that you don't know what you're gonna encounter mm -hmm. and I often use the analogy of bears right like you have a polar bear you mm -hmm. have a, a brown bear you have the if you just had one type of bear for you know if bears went to the Arctic and they mm -hmm. couldn't adapt you right. they ne would never they would have died yeah. right so right. like how is that bear or how is that species or thing able to adapt it has a little bit of flexibility it's not so rigid and yeah, so right. stuck yeah so i like that point is 80 percent and a number yeah it's a that, number that's, that's a number like, yeah that's the amount of specialization that you have at that specialization phase so there are I different like charts that. and different diagrams that people have come up with so you know it might be like the other way Mm. Like it's uh, only 20% on your primary sport, 80% do in general. And then as you grow and develop, it becomes 50-50, 60-40, right. um, up to 80-20, but it's never 100. Right. Maybe in season. Right. And that's why you have periodization phases, right? And so then you're off season, but you need to have some type of an off season. That's where you can get some of that training in. Mm. You know, that's the tough part with lots of our sports with specialization. Like you look at like tennis seasons, they go nine months. Mm. So are you in season nine months out of the year? Like, where's your off season? How do you fit that in? So there right. are different times. And then you could really look at what your key matches are and then right. back that off a little bit. Like, here's, here's my period of time where I could integrate some of this into the program just to keep it going. Right. And is there an age where you might say specialization is a little too young? Because, like, at that point, you said the parent is picking it kind mm -hmm. of right. almost, yeah. right? Like, yeah. oh, I want my kid to do hockey. They're going to be hockey. They're going to be the hockey player. They're gonna, and I'm going to sh throw them in hockey from yeah. youth forever. Yep. Or, you know, they're saying, no, this is what I want to do is mm -hmm. hockey. And But so is there an age where maybe even if you have this potential or how do we even know if you have the potential right like what yeah. age does is there an age that you might there isn't because growth and development isn't linear like, right. like we all grow and develop at different rates so somebody at 12 might be here and somebody at 14 might still be here they're still waiting to get there right so you have to let them grow into their own bodies and see when their potential comes um, there is a, a skills an athletic talent model that came out of the UK that looked at looking at talent in physical education. Mm. Like the phys ed teacher seeing them doing all these different games and sports and stuff, which we don't do anymore. Mm. But back then, like if you yeah. learned all these different sports, like how are kids going to learn to not specialize if they're not getting that information anywhere? Right. Where are you going to learn all the different sports? Right. All the clubs that are out there, they're for profit generally. They make money if you continue to play their sport. It's just the way it's set up. So if you're going to introduce kids to different sports, you have to have some mechanism to do that. Mm. But if the only thing in your community is that soccer association, your kid's playing soccer. <laughs> right. Right. So unless you have somebody in the physical education setting, it's like, hey, look, I know we only have soccer in our community. That's great. Here's some other skills that we can learn that help soccer. Here's some other things you don't get in soccer. Let's learn all these different things. But the athletic model um, got a really bad rap mm. in phys ed when they switched to the fitness model. Mm. Like it's all about lifetime fitness. Right. Well, Whose lifetime fitness, right? That was another adult construct. Right. That you didn't really learn the skills that you needed to be able to do whatever it is you decided to do for your lifetime. So you're going to follow these things, which really didn't require physical education, by the way. Mm. Walking, like think of the physical lifetime fitness activities. They're not taught in phys ed. Right. Right. Walking, swimming, jogging, mm. maybe mountain climbing, maybe biking, maybe tennis. Right. But there were none of like only two of those have movement outside of the sagittal plane. Right. And only two of those are something that can be taught in phys ed. Like you don't teach kids to walk in phys ed generally. We should. Right. If you ever watch the way some of the kids walk, they, they could use a little help, a little right. assistance to get that skill back. Right. But like we should be a little bit more intentional and follow an LTAD um, template. 
mm. throughout phys ed to help kids learn all the different skills through sports, through activity, through recreation, not just through activities of whatever that we think is going to be a lifetime. Right. Because kids miss opportunities. So they miss all these different opportunities that they could have had right. for lifetime physical activity that they would have liked, but yeah. they never got the opportunity to even know that because they, they, who's going to teach them that? Right. So how do you think uh, phys ed programs can improve today? Well, I think it's really cool to have the new standards that just came out and they, they realized that physical literacy is not an outcome, mm. right? It's a process. You're on a lifetime journey of physical literacy. And then like, if I'm a physically literate mountain climber, am I a physically literate ultimate Frisbee player? Right. There's always something, there's always a new challenge. There's always some other way to become physically literate right. in other ways. We have created measurement tools for it but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're physically littered if you meet this set of criteria. Mm. So I think if we could use LTAD as that framework for motor skill development, strength development, getting a variety of skills, being happy, confident, having the ability to think that you can do it, right? So I always talk to my students, like, how many of you are really confident in your math abilities? Mm. Maybe two, That's why we're not math majors. Right. Like we never really got that confidence to do math, right? right. So how many of you are really getting the confidence to be physically active? They're right. not. Right. Like it's the only class or the only activity where kids get called out in front of the class. Like think of something as simple as kickball. Mm. Like do you remember how many kids were turned off from, oh, from doing it just because yeah. they never really learned how to kick the ball. Right. And there they are in front, of, in front of the whole class yeah. trying to kick that ball that they never really learned how to do in the first place. Yeah. Like where was the lead up games to kickball? Right. Nothing. You just, right. all right, here's the ball, you roll it. Some kid figure out, hey, if I put a spin on it, there's no way they're ever going to kick that ball, right? <laughs> so they put the spin on it, the kid misses it completely. They're forever humiliated. They hate right. physical education. Then they get down to the Board of Education, like, no more phys ed. Right. Right? So all these, like, for, for sometimes we're our own worst enemy with that. Like, if you really want kids to be able to do these things, what would the, how, do they know the skills to be able to do it? And if not, can you modify it some way? Like, why don't you start off playing kickball with the ball sitting right at the plate? Right. You kick it. Right, right. <laughs> so if you look at how the skills are developed, can I kick it standing still? Mm. Can I kick it taking one step, two steps? Can, mm. I, can I kick it if you roll it a little bit? Mm. And then go all the way back and now roll it to me, right? So we never do that. We don't do right. the progressions of skills. We just say, yep, here's the skill. And, you know, those are those kids that are already along that developmental continuum. They're the earlier matures. They're going to kick that ball right off the bat they're going to mm. be good those are the ones that you know they're good at every sport they're in third grade they're good at everything right you got the other kid like they, they don't really have that opportunity they're not that good and they're not going to develop it because you just turned them off right yeah i couldn't agree more um we have a workshop coming up in new york city deliberate practice oh cool and it you know we're trying to make some improvements uh mm -hmm. in that realm mm -hmm. but exactly that like you know taking opportunities to practice these skills and mm -hmm. modify the games right. you know i see there's a lot of ways that i see that uh, things can be improved but you know modifying yeah. and and giving time to practice and having small groups like right. not right. necessarily everybody yeah. staring sure. at you oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to do the pacer test in front of the whole class right right the, actually way back when it was naspy they had a really cool position statement on testing and physical mm. education. There was supposed to be an instructional tool. And so you would be in a group and you would learn about cardiovascular fitness and how the PACER test tested it mm. and then what to do with the results to improve it. Not that you're called out in front of the class and then all your results are posted on the wall and that determines your grade. Right. Because I would do a presentation I'm like, all right, how many people here read the fitness gram training manual? Nobody, right. Nobody ever raises their hand. I read it. <laughs> I don't know why. But, you know, clearly says in the manual not to be used for testing and grading purposes. Yes. Yes. Right? It, it's to help guide instruction. It's yes. to help your kids get better. Right. But that's not what we did with it when it came out that we wanted to have physical education as a core subject so that you get Title IV funds and all the other things that were associated with that. Right. And then that just kind of went the wrong direction. Right. Yeah, man, a lot of really good points there. Um, I mentioned the piece about parents before, coaches. Mm -hmm. Are there any things that coaches, you know, you still see sometimes uh, coaches who are yelling at their athletes right, yeah. and a yeah. bit aggressive or, but uh, are there any advice for coaches? Well, unfortunately we're, we're not at Tom Ferry's project play right. today. So, right. uh, project play he has Kristen Diefenbach from the U S council of coaching excellence. Okay. And, um, one of the guys who's actually with project play and they're talking about what coaching education should look like. Mm. So I think we really need to have, and we had this conversation yesterday, the, there's a Philadelphia Coaches Conference yesterday and they talked about this. Like to be in the school, you have to at least go through four years of college to get mm -hmm. your degree 
and then you have to pass your certification exam in your subject. Mm. Yet to coach, are you interested? Will you do it? <laughs> right. Will you take the low amount of pay to do it? Right. And give all of your time for the students because you have a good heart? It's true. Come on, you can coach. Right, so we don't have the proper training for coaches. Like all these things we've been talking about, yeah. like how are coaches going to know that? How are they mm. going to learn that unless we can give it to them? And are they going to want to do it, recognizing that they're already working all day? Right. So we haven't re really created a funnel for coaches to be coaches. So I think one of the cool things we could do. This came up yesterday. I thought it was a really great idea. Like to have all of the local nonprofits and the school districts get together uh, in Philadelphia, and they wanted to create a system whereby coaches could become coaches. Mm. So, all right, so let's say you work with this program after school, but during the day, you could work over here and do this, and then mm. you could work over here and do this. So you're a coach. Mm. Your job now is a coach to be able to do that because internationally, a lot of our top-level coaches work with our lowest developmental athletes right. to help build them to get to that point. We don't. Our right. top-level coaches work with those who already have been built. Right. They take them from here to here. Right. You know, over there, they take them from here to there. Right. So it's a huge growth pattern. So since we're not going to do it that way, though, um, just to have some type of coaching education requirement, Project Play's been talking about it for years, USOPC's been talking about it for years, USCCE's been talking about it for years, but there finally has to get some teeth. There was right. just a report that came out about the U.S. Olympic Committee, the, the Congressional Commission that put that out there. Right. Coaching education is one of the key um, suggestions that they had. Right. So I think there has to be some level of coaching education um, Tom Ferry did a really cool uh, webinar where he's talking about like changing youth sports, college sports, Olympic sports. And one of the things they talked about is maybe organizations have to register. Mm. Like before you can use a field, register with the township or the recreation commission and then show proof right. that you have these coaching credentials. Because, mm -hmm. you know, again, I was, I was at the field the other day and there was a guy out in right field. His kid apparently was the one up at bat. He swung and he missed. The guy's screaming at him from right, right field. I'm like, I want to say something, right? But right. if I do, it's worse. Right. Right? Because now I'm belittling dad in front of the kid, and dad's right. really going to fly right. off the handle now, right? <laughs> right? So you can't do that, but like, there needs to be something in place right. so the coaches to, address, know, this. to yeah. address that. Like, you would never do that in any other situation. Right. Like, why is it okay in sport? Why do we think that that's okay, especially when you're eight? Right. Right? Right. So the kid could have just, you know, like, ball kid. Like, when I was playing sports, I was easily distracted. Mm. I could be standing there, next thing you know, the ball's sailing right by me because <laughs> I'm not paying any attention, right? It's not that I could. <laughs> didn't catch it but yeah. I but until they figured out that I had distraction issues right they thought that I just didn't really care I'm like no I right right airplane right. goes by and I'm watching that instead in the field I yeah. was the same way <laughs> right? looking around yeah. little ADHD yeah. I think yeah. all phys ed teachers have a little bit I of think our, so right or, so we got you know into, yeah. our background exercise science yeah <laughs> something but you know like we don't think about that with kids like like right. we're thinking, well, you know, you're 40 years old. You could focus for as long as it takes to hit a home run to get that college scholarship. <laughs> I'm like, no, I got so many other things I could rather be doing right now. Right. Yeah, but now you're just screaming at me. It makes me want to do it even less. Right, right. So, yeah, I think for coaches, there has to be some type of mandatory training. Right. Something like, and I know there are a lot of coaches that will do it on their own. Like, they'll listen to webinars. They'll go to podcasts. They'll go to professional development. A lot of organizations will have, like, their own, like, soccer has their own um, licensing Right. requirements does everybody do it no because it's not required like nobody's making anybody go do that generally right. but it's available um it just needs to be more structured and available so the coaches will do it to help really to increase the the sports scene for kids so right. that they want to do it like kids are dropping out of sports faster than ever right fewer and fewer kids are playing sports like video games don't yell at kids right it's right? true so i could say i could be competitive sitting at home and if i want to shut it off i shut it off if it's the third inning, I can't shut it off. I'm stuck. Right. And then I got to have the car ride home. And then I got to hear about it tomorrow. And then I got to go back to practice. So we, yeah. we, we make it unsuccessful for a lot of kids, unfortunately. And now we're competing with a lot of this technology, yeah. too. So you're yeah. going to have to keep up with that. Yeah. 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 Um, any gender differences? We touched on it a little mm -hmm. bit. But boys and girls, it, do all these rules apply for boys and girls? Are there any differences? You know, generally speaking, like fitness rules and sports training rules, they apply for both sexes. Yeah. Um, the things that don't apply is like the reasons why kids play sports sometimes. Mm. And it's different. Like sometimes we tend to um, pigeonhole mm. one sex. Well, well, you know, girls like this and boys like that. It's not always the case for all girls or all boys, mm -hmm. but you have to really get to know who you're working with and what they do like right. to see if that really makes sense. And we don't do that well enough. Like sometimes they say that, you know, girls tend to be a little bit more social. They, they go out and they play sports more for the social aspect. That's really, really important. Mm. And that bonding. 
Well, some boys teams are the same way. Right. So it doesn't mean just because you're on a boys team, like, oh, you don't care about that. Like, right. you have to really figure out, is that really what happens with your group or not? And then how do you use that to move forward with how you're training them? But like in terms of motor skills, we all have the same, the, the motor skills categories are the same for boys and girls. Mm. Right, our ability to get better, our ability to increase our strength. It's all the same for boys and girls. The training methodology is the same. Mm. How you get them together, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in groups, that might differ based on their needs and interests and likes, and so you would want to do that. So you know, if you have a 12-year-old girl and you're going to send her to a private trainer, it might not be the best strategy. That might not be how she rolls. Mm. might be, though. She might not want to be with her peers in that mm. environment. She might say, you know, like, until I catch up, yeah, let, let me go do that private trainer, and then I'll, then I'll join the group, right? Right. But like, you, you can't just make the assumption that because some, some of the evidence suggests that girls like to be in groups more, that they should always be in a group. Right. And uh, so girls can also benefit from resistance training Absolutely. and weightlifting. And At least as much. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mentioned that because sometimes I wonder, you know, when we think about, you know, what kids want to do, mm -hmm. sometimes they might not want to do it because culturally it's unacceptable. Exactly. There's like that yeah. whole what came first, the chicken or the egg mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like knowing that culturally it should be accepted mm -hmm. and it is beneficial for you. Yeah. Now, if you still choose to maybe do things differently yeah. and we're following some mm -hmm. of, you know, listening to our, you know, uh, kids and things like that. But, you know, encouraging girls that it is okay to lift. You're not going to stack on muscle like a right. boy. Yeah, yeah, right. Where, is that accurate as well? Well, yeah, pre-pubertal, pre neither is, right? Right. But, you know, once once a growth spurt hits and then you're in puberty, girls are not going to have the same level of development. Some are going to have more than they think they would. Right. Right. So we're all genetically predetermined what we're going to have. So you have to watch that for right. some girls. But generally speaking, no. Right. And oftentimes, uh, you know, there's that um, natural selection. Mm. Like we all tend to gravitate toward a sport that we would do well in mm. because we have the body style for it. Mm. You know, so if you're going to be somebody who's going to be bulking up, you're typically not going to be a distance runner. Right. Right. So you're not going to go, oh, I don't want to get bulking. Well, you're probably never going to get that anyway. But, right. you know, you never know. But so just watch all that stuff and, and figure out those patterns and, and how to get kids to be just in shape. Do, right. And put it in practice. You're talking earlier, and I love the comment, too, that be creative. Yeah. You don't have to have, all right, so now we're going to do our exercises. Everybody get your band standard right. attention. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, like, that's our old military style of how we do coaching in the U.S. Right. They came from World War II. We're in lines. We're in squads. Yeah. We're in rows. We do this drill. Drill, drill, drill. It's like that mentality. You can do it a different way. You right. It's part of warm-up. Yeah. Right. Circle the bases when you come home. Do something like like put it in there so like it's fun. Mm. Like it doesn't have to be a regimented thing. Well, all right, everybody grab your dumbbells and let's stand over here. Like you can put it into circuits, different things and practices, and just really keep it interesting. And then have the kids figure out how to put it together. I love it. Last big question that I have, and then I'll just open the floor generally. But it, we are able to categorize fitness and know those buckets like oh we should have strength training we should have aerobic training we should have flexibility things like that power development but when it comes to motor skills would you say that there's any motor skills or buckets or you know before you mentioned the planes of motion like mm -hmm. should parents look and see like well this sport has a little bit more of this plane and maybe i should do some sports that mm -hmm. have a different plane yeah, yeah. Yeah. are there any buckets that we should look out for motor skills motor skills yeah because they're generally the three different categories are so locomotor which are the ones we always think about like running skipping hopping jumping and all that stuff yeah. um there's object control throwing catching striking and all those different things and then there's like th it's called different things by different people like, calling it body awareness mm. like how aware am i of my body in space can mm. i land mm. can i roll so all the different skills like that fit into that category and when you go through the list of them like you could see which sports have which ones that was kind of the premise of the athlete skills model too mm. like they looked at some of the skills which ones were missing how can i complement them either through training or through playing another sport to bring that one up to speed mm -hmm. so i think that's a cool way of looking at it um so can i put that into practice sure because that was always like the criticism of kids who are always playing soccer mm -hmm. where's your upper body development put it into practice right right so right. i had a friend of mine who said you know my girls just love playing softball mm -hmm. they're in third grade and all they want to do is play softball and i can't get them to do anything else so i play soccer for your warm-up Mm. You want them to get into condition, right? Doesn't mean you have to have them running up and down the hills or all around the softball field or around the block. 
right play soccer <laughs> play right. games they're going right. to get in shape so you can do right. your cardiovascular training in so many different ways you can do your strength in different ways so like all these really cool challenges and you'll see them in phys ed class a lot too right so you can do different push-up challenges weight challenges tug of war all the cool things we all grew up with yeah there's so many different ways of doing it but for some reason we say well if it's not struggling if it doesn't look like the way adults are doing right. it it's not good right yeah. so your know, parents come in like i want my kid to push the sled because i saw this athlete and they were pushing the sled i'm like right you feel like saying, but your kid doesn't really walk all that well yet. <laughs> so why don't we work sure. on, you know, like those motor skills and then we'll push something. But, you know, maybe the sled's exactly what that kid needs to learn how to walk better. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Right. But if they want to do it, I'm like, yeah, so I'll figure out how to load it to help right. them to move that skill along right. where they need to be. Because sometimes I think there's something that clicks in parents' head. Right. Like, yeah. If I could just get them to hold on to something, maybe they would be able to do that motor pattern a little bit better. Right. So, like, put all that cool stuff in. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not expensive. Like, you don't have to get an expensive sled. There's, like, those really cool ones that go on the carpet and they slide on the floor now and you yeah. put weights on top. Yeah. It's great yeah. stuff. There's so Kids many just things see that and they want to, yeah. right? Like, oh, yeah. the, the things that think about yourself, right? It looks yeah. like a playground. You walk in and you're like, wow, this looks fun. What's right. going on in yeah. here? Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> like a Vertec, right? You want right. kids to be able to jump? Right. Give them a target. Yeah. I hit the blue one. Yeah, I yeah. got to hit the red one, right? So, and kids will do that all day long, and they'll be exhausted. Right. Like, all right, let's jump in place. Like, ah. Oh. Right. Jeremy Frisch, I don't know if you have follow him too, but he yep. had a, he had a pretty cool post. Like, it was like elementary jumping skills and physical education, mm. like jumping over obstacles, and then they had sports jumping skills, developmental level, snap downs. Mm -hmm. right? Like, why? Like, why? Why are we all on the same page with what these skills should look like? Right. So that as you develop, we're all singing the same song, basically rather than like it's different in phys ed than it is in sports and why right. like, like let's bring it all together for for the kids for our motor skill development i love it i really appreciate your time this yeah, was a super insightful conversation yeah, cool. right up my alley and i couldn't agree with you more with all of the points that you've yeah, made cool. yeah so um yeah, I appreciate your time right, and, cool. and worth thank the drive you for then? today. Yeah, oh, absolutely <laughs> right, worth cool. the drive. I right, couldn't good, wait good. to get here. All right, very cool. <laughs> the whole way home, I'm going to be just, you know, yeah. dreaming about half yeah. of the things that were said in this episode. Yeah, and I would say, like, how do we implement it? Like, how do we get it out to coaches? Yeah. Like, is there a way that we could create something that could, we always thought there should be like an LTAD for dummies. Right. Yeah, you know, we'll call it that, of course, but like something that's like a pocket guide. Right, something right. You, you would say, all right, so here, here's what you need. You've just got... Your kid wants to play softball. If you don't coach the team, they don't have a team. What are you gonna do? Right. Here. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the NSCA does a pretty good job with that stuff yeah. between a position statement yeah. and like, you know, if you just, you know, put a search on it and mm -hmm. like, there's a couple fact questions that right. come right up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it's more so, I think, getting people into that process. Like I tell students all the time, I'll ask them a question, they'll say what they feel. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, don't, you know, you're going based on your limited bias experience right, and you yeah. want to look to these uh, organizations before mm -hmm. you, you know, make your decision sure. and at yeah. least know what they're saying. Even if you yeah. don't agree, know what yeah, they're yeah. saying yeah. before you right. disagree with it. Yeah. But just getting to that mindset of mm -hmm. looking to the NSCA yeah. that right. now already has this laid out for you. Right. Exactly. Like all the answers are there. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just asking, so what's the first thing people do, especially mm -hmm. a young college student? They'll say, hmm, what did I do when I was young? Right, exactly. And yeah. did I start, when did I start weightlifting? Oh, I started when I was 14. Mm -hmm. Oh, I yep. felt pretty good about that. Right, well, yeah. 14 is a good 14's, time. Yeah, Everybody good goes on their yep. own yeah. limited experience. Right, yeah. And then the organizations are doing a better job of pooling, mm -hmm. you know, and scanning this stuff. But so it's just kind of really getting people into that process of yeah. looking in the right place for yeah. the answers. Yeah. Yeah. And that comes back to the education piece, like right. you were saying. Because sure. yep. yep. some of it's there. Oh, yeah. Um, we just got to get it out there. Yeah, cool. So thank you for thank, today. Thank you. Appreciate we'll it. We'll officially really close cool. here.